So we're moving, uh, really what we're about to do is move from, from Hinduism to uh, talking about Buddhism. And we're going to spend a lot of time uh, on Buddhism just as we spent a, a good amount of time on Hinduism. Uh, but as, a, uh, as I say on the handout, as a kind of interlude, just for this morning, uh, Sunday, we're going to talk about Jainism. And I, let me just say this. Uh, I am... Uh, sure that I'm mispronouncing this. Uh, when, when, I've, when I've heard native speakers refer to it, it sounds something between Jainism and Jainism. And I just can't seem to say whatever that in-between word is. Uh, and so I lean towards Jain and Jane just because I, I don't want it confused with some woman named Jane, right? Uh, <laughs> So, uh, so I'm saying Jainism, but I know I'm mispronouncing that, and uh, I, I apologize. All right, so uh, Jainism, the reason why it's, this is an interlude, we're not spending more time on Jainism, even though we probably should, is because it's not one of the five major world religions that we talked about uh, at the beginning. Remember, we talked about uh, those as being Hinduism, Buddhism, uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Uh, and since this isn't in uh, that top five in terms of population, it just gets one class, uh, unfortunately. There are uh, about four million Jains in the world, uh, and uh, I've seen different counts of that, some placing it closer to five million, uh, but most closer to four million. <clears throat> and uh, by and large, mostly in India. Uh, and we'll talk about this, but there are two schools of thought, or two, two uh, to use an English uh, American word, denominations, you might say. There's two, two forms of Jainism, one in northern India and one in southern India. And we'll talk a little bit about that. The names uh, Jain and Jainism come from the Sanskrit word Jina, which means uh, victor or conqueror. But what you need to know is that this is not uh, victor or conqueror in the sense of someone uh, going off to battle in a military sense, uh, because the primary uh, virtue and practice and habit of the Jains is what they call ahimsa or nonviolence, which uh, they take to an extreme degree. Uh, um, and I don't mean that in a bad way, uh, but uh, even things that we might not consider violence, they consider violence and uh, don't engage in. Uh, some scholars taking an edict perspective, and you remember the difference between edict and, and emic, Edict perspective is the perspective of someone from the outside. Uh, an emic perspective is the perspective of someone from the inside of a tradition. Uh, so we're always, in some sense, looking at things from an edict perspective. But I use the language as much as I can of the different traditions so that uh, you get more of a sense of the emic perspective uh, to the extent that I can convey that as someone who's not in the tradition themselves. Some scholars taking, taking an edict perspective uh, will identify the Mahavira as the uh, founder of Jainism. And we'll talk about him in just a minute. But Jains themselves say that the Mahavira uh, is not the founder. Uh, in fact, he's the last of the Tirtankara, or the 24th of the Tirtankara. Uh, the Jain teachers who have achieved the goal of Jainism, moksha, just like in, uh, in Hinduism, though understood differently, uh, who have achieved that but, but stuck around to teach the rest of us, in a sense. Uh, and so uh, he's the last one, uh, the 24th Tirtankara. And Tirtankara is, a, again, a Sanskrit word. It means something like uh, the builder or finder of a ford, like in, in a river, uh, a place to cross over. Uh, 
And so, um, let's talk a little bit about him. Uh, the Mahavira. <coughs> Mahavira is a title. So just like Buddha is a title that means a light, enlightened or awakened one, Mahavira is a, is a title that means great hero. You remember the Mahabharata is, is the great Bharat, great India. Um, uh, Gandhi was called Mahatma, uh, great soul. So he's the Mahavira, uh, the great hero. Uh, but he was uh, born uh, Nataputa or Damana, and there's uh, some disagreement over when exactly he was born. He was born around 599 BC, or he was born around 578 BC, or he was born around 540 BC. Uh, but all all accounts put him in northern and I think northeastern <coughs> India uh, for his birth. He was. Uh, his varna, uh, his place in that system was, uh, he was a, a kshatriya. You remember the kshatriyas are the, uh, the military, uh, the warrior caste. That was the family he was born into. Uh, now, again, uh, if you're taking... Uh, the Emic perspective, the perspective of giants themselves, they claim that his parents were already adherents of Jainism. Uh, Jainism as it had been taught by the 23rd Tirthankara Parshva. Uh, so they were already committed to this. Uh, now, because ahimsa, nonviolence, is uh, the highest ideal. Uh, and the highest virtue for giants that makes it really hard to be a kshatriya uh, or to be a warrior, right? But that's uh, the situation he was born into. He was the second son of a noble family. Uh, and at the age of about 30, he leaves home, leaves his family, uh, and goes uh, to seek out... How are we doing with him? Goes out to to seek uh, liberation from samsara. You remember samsara is the cycle of rebirth and redeath. Uh, he spends 12 years in fasting, in uh, meditation, and in all sorts of ascetic practices to uh, uh, gain control of the body and uh, to uh, uh, advance the jiva, the soul, over the body. Uh, at the age of 42, uh, it's said that uh, after he had renounced all things and even lost his loincloth, his only piece of clothing, uh, that uh, he, he was uh, finally free of all possessions uh, and he achieved uh, Kavala, uh, gosh, I'm going to try and pronounce this, Jnana, Jnana, or uh, Kavala Jnana, which is omniscience or perfect wisdom, uh, infinite understanding. At the age of 42, so I've, I've still got four years. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, so that makes him a Kabbalah, uh, one who has attained perfect or infinite wisdom and understanding. It makes him an Arahant, one who has attained victory over the passions and attachments. It makes him a Jinnah, a conqueror or a victor. That is how he becomes the Mahavira, the great hero. Uh, after achieving this state, he uh, does what happens. He gathers disciples. He begins to teach them. Uh, he forms them into a sangha or a community. Uh, I should say that uh, if, if you haven't noticed, based on the dates, he is alive around the same time that the Upanishads and the Aranyakas are being composed. Uh, so there's already this movement uh, in India towards this kind of spiritual wisdom that's accessible not just to the Brahmins, but to uh, the Kshatriyas and the Vaishyas. Uh, this kind of leaving the Vedic rituals aside and seeking a kind of spiritual enlightenment.
Uh, and as such, he rejects the Vedas. Uh, Jainism has nothing to do with the Vedas uh, that are so central to Hinduism. Uh, so, uh, and nothing to do with the Upanishads or Aranyakas, except that he's living around the same time as they're, of them being composed, and which is also, he's roughly contemporaneous with uh, the Buddha, who, as we'll see, is another member of the Kshatriya caste who leaves his life of privilege to seek uh, spiritual enlightenment. Uh, so, he establishes a sangha, or a community, uh, and then towards, uh, af after doing all of this uh, for about 30 years, he finally uh, does what is the um, expectation of a great saint uh, in the Jain tradition to do. Uh, he as firmly establishes himself without moving and begins to refuse to eat or drink until his body eventually fails and his jiva is released and he achieves moksha, liberation from karma and samsara. And that was sometime around either 527 or 510 or 468 BC, depending on who you talk to. All right. Uh, so really quickly, what are we looking uh, like for time? Ten minutes. Hmm? Ten minutes. Till. Ten minutes. Till. Okay. So we've got about five minutes. So uh, the Sangha, or the community of, uh, of Jains, of Jain adherents, uh, takes a fourfold structure uh, because some people follow the Mahavira and his extreme asceticism. <coughs> And other people said, we really like what you're, what you're laying down here, but uh, we're not ready to give up our loincloths and, uh, and starve ourselves to death just yet. We know that's the way, but not yet. Uh, and so uh, there uh, was essentially one major division between those who uh, followed the extreme asceticism of the Mahavira and those who uh, continued to live in the world, you might say. These are the uh, shravakas, uh, the householders, is what the word means. Uh, and um, so you'll see that the, the fourfold community is uh, the male ascetics, the female ascetics, the um, <coughs> male householders, and the female householders are essentially wives. And, uh, and, but all giants take five vratas or vows. Uh, the first is ahimsa, which is nonviolence in action and in thought. Because your thoughts, the thoughts of your jiva, will lead to the actions that you do. So you have to not only renounce violence in your actions, but in your thought. That's violence towards any sentient being. Anything that has a jiva. Now, we, we often talk about souls, and sometimes in, in the West we'll say only humans have souls, or if you follow, like I do, Thomas Aquinas, you'll say that there are uh, three different levels of souls. There's vegetative souls, there's uh, um, locomotive souls, or the souls of animals, and then there are rational souls like humans have. But for, uh, for giants, uh, all sorts of things have jivas. Not just humans, but uh, plants, animals, insects, microbes, uh, even uh, rocks, earth can have jiva. So, uh, so doing, not doing violence towards a jiva is a, is a big thing, right? Because uh, if you just uh, sit down on the ground and you accidentally sit on some little bug, you have done violence towards a jiva. If you cut into the earth uh, for plowing, as like a farmer does, you're doing violence to a jiva. They won't eat, so obviously they won't eat uh, meat, right? Uh, but they also are, um, tend to try and only eat, for example, fruits or whatever that have already dropped from a tree. 
right? Instead of picking it. Uh, and, uh, and so, uh, you know, there's just the extremes that you oftentimes see them wearing a mask over their mouth so they don't accidentally breathe in some kind of microscopic creature and, and, and hurt it. Uh, so anyway, extreme form of ahimsa. They also commit to satya, which is truth-telling. Uh, uh, unless, of course, telling the truth leads to violence. That would be the one time when, when maybe you just remain silent. Uh, and asteya, which is taking only what is given. This is, you know, not stealing anything. Uh, Brahmakarya, uh, chastity uh, for the householders or celibacy for the uh, so, and that's pretty traditional, what we might assume also. If you're not married, uh, then, then you remain celibate until you are married. Once you're married, uh, you uh, will only um, engage in those practices with your spouse. Uh, but the, uh, the ascetics themselves uh, have no, you know, they're completely celibate, and they need to be celibate, not just in action, but again, in mind. Uh, and finally, uh, a piragraha, non-attachment or renunciation of possessions. Uh, there are three possessions that are allowed for, uh, for the ascetics, um, the, the munis or sadhus, uh, and the ariyakas or sadhis. Uh, this is a water bowl, or gourd that's been hollowed out. Uh, that's for water for cleaning and purification. It's not for putting your food in. It's not a food bowl like in uh, Buddhism. You, when you receive food from someone, you just receive it in your hand. And you don't eat it with utensils or anything like that. You just eat it right out of your hand. Uh, and you, you only, uh, if, you're, if you're one of, the ascetics, you fast quite a bit, and when you do eat, you only eat once in a day, uh, and you want to make sure that uh, when you eat, it's daylight out, because if it's nighttime, you might not see some living thing that's on the food, and you might accidentally eat it. Uh, uh, those are the and, uh, so the other thing that they have is a, is a whisk or a broom usually made of um, uh, feathers from, uh, that have fallen off, not been plucked, uh, from a peacock. Uh, and this is used to sweep the ground before you walk or before you sit down. So you don't, again, sit on any kind of bug or, or insect or whatever. Uh, they also won't wear shoes for that matter. Uh, and uh, finally, the uh, giant writings or scriptures. But to say scriptures is, is uh, there's not a clear canonical text shared by all giants. So depending on which group you're a part of, you have certain scriptures or certain writings that you go back to. But they're not super important in the way that, uh, say, the Vedas are for Hindus. Uh, or the Upanishads, for that matter, or, or the, uh, the epics. <clears throat> so, um, sometime after the Mahavira came Moksha, uh, which is sometimes called Nirvana, the Sankha split into two, the Digambra and the uh, Swetambra. Uh, and, like I said, they each had their separate scriptures. Uh, the names tell you the main difference between them. The Digambra, are the sky clad. That means they follow the Mahavira strictly. Uh, he gave up his loincloth, so the men ascetics or the Munis uh, also go naked. And uh, I, don't, I don't know, uh, Nancy and Jack, when y'all were in India, if you saw any of uh, the, um, the giant ascetics walking around in the buff, but uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's just a part of it's just a part of society, right? It's just accepted uh, that that's what they do. Uh, women, on the other hand, are not allowed to do that. Uh, so even if you're uh, a woman ascetic, uh, then um, 
you still have to wear a white, a simple white garment, which also means that you're not prepared uh, yet to reach moksha in this lifetime. You'll have to be reborn as a man so you can uh, do the full uh, asceticism required for moksha. You can be fully dispossessed of your possessions. Uh, <clears throat> the Swetamara disagree and for them, uh, and, and they have slightly different wording because they use two different languages, uh, both related to Sanskrit, but two different languages. For them, the, the sadhu and the sadhi, uh, the male and the female ascetics, in fact, uh, all wear these simple white garments. And, and a female ascetic, a sadhi, can in fact reach moksha in this lifetime. And I know I've got I've to go ahead and wrap this up here. Uh, so, uh, just to point out a few important concepts, uh, and these are going to sound really familiar, but they're going to mean different things. Uh, samsara is a cycle of rebirth, that's the same thing as in Hinduism. The jiva, you remember at the time of the Upanishads, jiva and atman are basically interchangeable as words for the soul, and, uh, and though that later changes, uh, but it... Um, Jainism sticks with jiva, or sometimes calls the soul the jivatman. Uh, but anyway, this is the thing that lives on, uh, that's reborn again and again. Uh, there is, therefore, reality can be broken down into jiva and ajiva. And ajiva are the things that aren't sentient in the world. And they have five categories for that. Dharma, not as we've understood Dharma in the past, Dharma, but uh, Dharma is motion, Adharma is rest, Akasha is space, uh, Pugala is inert matter, and uh, Kala as time. And for them, uh, when speaking of time, the universe is eternal, it had no creator, uh, and uh, it will not end. In nature, uh, they do believe in karma, but again, different karma in Hinduism just means action, and actions have consequences. For them, karma is a kind of substance that attaches itself to the jiva during your life based on your actions, and uh, will either drag you down into a lower uh, form of life, and when you're reborn, or drag you up. <coughs> or pull you up into a higher form of life when you're reborn in your next life. Uh, but the, what you want to do is be free from karma altogether. Uh, also, uh, um, dharma is uh, not dharma as it is in Hinduism, but just a, a description of the jain teaching of the way of life for a jain. What does it mean to be a jain? How do you live as a jain? Finally, moksha or nirvana is when the, uh, the jiva has shed itself of all karma. There's no karma clinging to it. It realizes its true and perfect state, which is to be infinite uh, and eternal. Uh, it doesn't merge with anything. It doesn't go anywhere. It just realizes its own individual infinity and eternity. Uh, and so you might ask, what about the devas? What about the gods and goddesses? Uh, they acknowledge the devas as beings who've had really good karma and they've reached this higher form of life. But if those devas want to actually reach moksha, which is the goal of existence, they'll have to be reborn as a human to do it. Uh, and as such, the devas are less important than humans. And you don't pray to the devas, you don't worship the devas, you certainly don't ask the devas for anything, for blessings or for help or anything like that. You're in a better position than they are. That's just the barest scratching of the surface, but we're going to have to end there. Thank you.